with us. Amen. All right. Well, we've got some wonderful things in store today, and I'm going to ask our speakers to come up on stage. We have been talking about, this is Jordan, Abel, and Simone. They're going to help bring the word today. Uh, we've been talking about being kingdom-minded. And to be kingdom-minded simply means that we, we come into this place, right? We get filled up on the word of God, but to be kingdom-minded is we take it out to the world daily, everywhere we go, right? This, this place is only a filling station. It's only for us to come in, break bread together, love on one another, get filled up on the word of God, worship together. But the kingdom of God, it is within but you know what? We're to take it out to those that are suffering. So I've chosen a few people to speak this week or this Sunday that uh, different reasons that I've asked them all to speak. Actually, Simone, today is her last Sunday. Stand up, Simone. She's going away to college. That is the only reason I would let her leave, right? She has been such an amazing blessing. And I um, She's helped in children's ministry, but you've done so many other things, and you've grown up in this church, so it's been a totally amazing. At the end of the service, we're going to pray over you, so God bless you. Abel, if you would stand. Abel is our children's director, and I thought, you know, he's got such a responsibility of ministering the word to kids, and your children's ministry is really growing, so God bless you. You're going to speak. And then Jordan. If you would stand, Jordan is um, a businessman in the community and has so many things that he does in the church. One is he leads our outreach ministry, but he also leads a businessmen's ministry in the valley. So if you're a businessman, you should connect with this guy. He's amazing. So God bless you. We've been talking about the kingdom of God, and today's message is about this. God's kingdom is the rule and reign of Christ. So we want to hear from these individuals and hear how um, they want to take the Word of God and connect with this valley and with the world. And you know, last week, we talked about everyone in here is a minister, right? And we said, we're all ministers, and our ministry is needed. And so I thought, how apropos it would be to call on people in our congregation to say, if, if you're called, what does it look like? So this is how it looks. All right, you guys. Ready, Abel? I guess. Just kidding. <laughs> yes, ready. Yes. Oh, I can't see the slide. Okay, kids, welcome to church. <laughs> okay, can we prep by opening up to our Bibles to Matthew 6.33? And as you guys get ready, I want to um, talk about the mission that I have decided to take on in kids' ministry, and that is to eventually have all the kids to bring their Bibles. And this is the one that I've been promoting, and this is uh, it's called the Explorer Bible for Kids, and it is the CSB uh, version. And I'm trying to turn it around. Um, it has pictures. It has QR codes. Um, it talks about the characters. If you scan the QR code, it takes you to a small video. And that video talks about that current lesson. And I got to tell you, I've been learning so much from this Bible because the pictures help a lot. <laughs> and, and you can be, um, I mean, like... Um, like Ray was talking about the King's James Version, like what use is it if you can't really understand anything, right? So this is really simple and it, and it helps a lot. So parents, I'm encouraging, um, if, if you don't have a Bible yet, I recommend this one, it's really good. And, um, and I love the physical Bible better than a digital Bible. And when I was trying to put this together, uh, like into a sentence as to why I prefer the physical over the digital. God kind of took my words and scrambled them and created a perfect sentence. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Um, oh, yes. 
Because I love the physical Bible over my phone because the Word of God is heavy and it takes up space. It takes faith to pick up your Bible, but even greater faith to make room in your spirit to carry these heavy words. So that's why when I carry this Bible, it reminds me of that. And the night that Pastor Stephanie asked me to speak, uh, I couldn't sleep that night. And God, and God dropped this um, word, bioavailability. And I was like, thank you, God, a word I can barely pronounce. <laughs> and um, yes. So I, li- I like to study um, health and nutrition. And right now I'm in doing the carnivore diet. So if there's any carnivores out there. <laughs> And um, so bioavailability is a percentage of nutrients in food that indicates how much um, you can absorb from the gut and use by our bodies. So an example would be like meat and eggs. They're at the highest percentage. So when you eat meat and eggs, your body is able to absorb almost close to 100% of all the nutrients in there. Uh, An example of something that has 0% is fiber. Our bodies cannot absorb fiber. So you can, you can take fiber in, but you won't get anything. It's, your body cannot absorb it. Um, so in the nutrition facts that you see on, on, on the food, that's the, that's the nutrition of the current state of that food. Um, but when you eat that food, that's different uh, because it depends on what your body can absorb or not. So if you take, for example, the, this Bible, it's full of nutrients. So you ingest the Bible, but if um, your bioavailability is zero, then it just comes out whole. <laughs> like you don't take anything in, right? So, so my question is, um, can, you go to, can you go to the next slide? So my question is, so if the Holy Spirit is within those that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, do new Christians receive a small dosage of the Holy Spirit? And maybe the awesome and cool people like Pastor Stephanie receive a greater amount of the Holy Spirit? And the answer is no. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. There's no higher power or lower power. Uh, God doesn't discriminate against everybody. Everybody receives the Holy Spirit. Oh. So I'll read from Matthew 6.33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Next slide. Oh. Um, how do we increase our bioavailability of the Holy Spirit? Next. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so first part. But seek the... F- but seek first the kingdom of God. How you do anything is how you do everything. And this is what I learned from my dad when I went to go and help in construction with him. I was, uh, I was trying to dig, but I was doing it like this. Like. <laughs> so, so my dad came over and he grabbed the shovel from me and he went, do it like this. <laughs> and I thought, oh, he's mad at me. But, you know, he's, he told me, if you're going to come and help, you're going to do it with all you got or don't come and help at all. So that's what I understood is how you do anything is how you do everything. And I kept that with me. So how intently are you seeking the kingdom of God? Are you just coming to church just to check off your to-do list? Or are you desperately seeking, like, when you lose your phone or your keys and you're looking for them? Has anybody lost their phone or their keys? And... And you become so desperate to the point that if you see a piece of paper laying flat on the table and your brain tells you, did you look under that paper? Maybe they're there. And, but then your brain also tells you, no, there's no way the, the keys can be there. I mean, it's just a piece of paper. And then you kind of look around. and then you, Oh, I knew it was in there. <laughs> so you become so desperate. So how, um, how intently are you seeking the kingdom of God? And go to the next slide. So the second part, all these things, and all these things will be provided for you, and that has to do with love. When we operate within the kingdom of God, being kingdom-minded, that's when we prosper. Um, an example is uh, Pastor Stephanie, she truly loves everyone, and because of that, um, all of you guys are, 
uh, feel that love, and sometimes you want to give things to her. Um, she doesn't ask for gifts, but somehow uh, you feel like, oh, I appreciate what she does for us, so you give things back. And honestly, she doesn't need them or um, she's asking for them. So in the same way, the best way to show God that you love him is by praying, worshiping, uh, reading the Bible, being obedient, and resting. Resting is a huge one. And because he loves you in return, He'll bless you with things that you have never even asked for or knew you needed. Uh, I believe our bioavailability is uh, in the Holy Spirit. Um, it has levels. So the more you're able to absorb of the Holy Spirit, um, the more you'll be able to hear him. You'll become um, spiritual sensitivity. Uh, you can hear him. You can receive dreams, downloads, and speaking tongues. So everybody has that ability but it depends on where your um, ability to absorb the Holy Spirit is. Uh, some people, the more intent you put in growing in the Spirit, the more that you're going to be able to uh, speak in tongues and just keep growing in the Spirit. And lastly, um, there is enough evil out there. We don't want to invite the devil into our kingdom. So can you go to the next slide? So Halloween is coming up, and as long as I am the director of kids' ministry, I will not celebrate the Devil's Day. I will continue to teach God's Word. Thank you. Thank you, Abel. He is awesome. I love those kiddos. As you guys know, I've been with those kiddos for the last couple months, and I would not hand it over to just anyone. This guy is the real deal, so... That is awesome. My name is Simone, and the rumor is true. I leave on Friday, and I am sad about it. But the Lord gave me a word this morning, so we will rejoice. Um, I am going to college, and I was asked, what will kingdom-mindedness look like? And I was really thankful that when I listened to Pastor Stephanie's message, she defined it, because I had no clue where to start. <laughs> She said, kingdom-mindedness is how you perceive your environment and your role in it. It starts from the moment you wake up. And I think that's interesting because what you perceive something to be is often what you label it. For example, I have this couch in my room. It has these like green and yellow fireworks on it and stripes and it's brown and I call it the ugly couch because I perceive it to be ugly. Therefore, it has earned its label. It is the ugly couch. I told my mom, I want a couch cover for the ugly couch. I didn't say I want a couch cover for the black couch, a couch cover for the living room couch. I said I want a couch cover for the ugly couch. What I perceived it to be is what I labeled it. So what you perceive something to be is what you believe it to be. And when you have an abundance in your heart, your mouth speaks. And so that's what you label it as. And when you label something, you begin to speak it over it. And when you begin to speak over something, you steer your experience. Just like a rudder on a boat steers the boat, James 3 tells us that's what speaking does. It begins to steer your experience. Just like a bit in a horse's mouth steers it. You speaking over your situation steers your experience. You labeling something steers your experience, which I thought was interesting because I started announcing that I was going to go to a public college and the reactions I got were insane. People would look at me and be like, oh, you don't belong at a secular college. You know, do you know what people are like there? Like they, they were like, I was gonna walk in and see mutants. And I'm like, well, they're people. Like, <laughs> God loves them too. And I kept telling them that. And they're like, no, but they do drugs. What are you going to do? <laughs> and they warn me. They give me all of these labels. They tell me this is what the people would be like. And this is what's going to happen. And this is coming from my Christian community. Not necessarily all of you. You guys are awesome. But I go to a Christian school and hang out with Christian friends. And all of my people are Christian. And that's what they're saying. They're saying, beware first. But really, that's giving more credit to what the enemy could do than what my God could do. See, it's so easy to believe or choose to perceive UC Merced as hopeless, chaotic, evil. 
just the enemy is running rampant. It's easy to perceive it as the enemy's camp. But when I read the word of God, Romans 10, 14 through 15 says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of who they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. When I read the word, I hear that all they need is to hear the name of Jesus. When I read the word, I read Acts 13, 47 through 49. And it says, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many were anointed to enter eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So what kingdom-mindedness looks like for me is perceiving you, Seymour said, not as the enemy's camp, but as a future expansion of his kingdom. So I ask you, what do you perceive your environment or season right now? Mothers, fathers, I'm sorry, but I work with kids all the time, so I have to call you out. You should not be calling it the terrible twos because you are labeling that season as terrible. Call it the triumphant twos, because you're going to see God work in powerful ways in their lives. You're going to see him move, and their hearts are going to be transformed. That's what the word says. So start calling it the triumphant twos. Don't call your job place or your workplace stressful. I, I don't, I've not had much of a job yet, and I'm sure it's pretty stressful, but you carry the peace of God, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when you walk into that place, yes, everyone else around you might be calling it stressful. But guess what? You're bringing peace into that place. You can label it as this is a place that God's going to start changing. This is a place that's going to turn around. This is a place that no one's going to recognize in a couple years. They're going to do things for God without even knowing it. So start labeling your workplace and your family and your marriage after what God's going to do, not necessarily what it looks like right now. Because I serve a God who took Saul to Paul, who took a sinner to a servant, who brought the dead things and brought them back alive, who brought the sick and made them healed, and who brought the hopeless and put them full of hope. So I might be walking onto a dark campus, but I'm no longer going to call it the dark campus or the place where God is not, because I got God and I'm bringing God with me. So being kingdom-minded... It's similar to basketball. I play a lot of basketball, so anytime I read the Bible, that's what I see. <laughs> so I'm reading the Bible, and it's like saying, okay, basketball, you look at the other team, you know what their strategy is, but you focus on yours more. So yes, it is wise to walk into Merced knowing I'm going to have to stay in the Word. Knowing I'm going to have to go to church, I'm going to have to find Christian friends because it's not always going to be easy. It's wise knowing that I'm going to be among serpents. But it is of most importance that we walk into our next environment and our next season kingdom-minded. Not with the mind of the enemy saying, oh, I know all their tactics. I'm going to avoid them. Because when you do that, you never score. When you do that, you're always on the defense. And the word of God says we have the authority to be on the offense. So that's kingdom-mindedness, is making sure you shoot to score. So when you see someone that they need the word of God, or they need your hands laid on them, or they need to believe in what you've got, you tell them, I got the solution. And more than ever is my generation looking for a solution. So let's be on the offense, and that's what kingdom-mindedness looks like for me. And so what does it look like for you, and how are you going to label your situation? Good job, you guys. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I have plenty of notes here, so be patient with me if I'm, uh, I'm reading, right? Um, so I'm Jordan. I'm the outreach director here. Um, I'm a business owner. And my calling with God is very clear to me. So I want to share with you my calling, but also how that applies to you guys. Um, first off, I want to eliminate three misconceptions I think there is 
just with the whole outlook on what being a disciple maker really is. Number one, full-time devotion to God means you need to be working in a church, you need to be a pastor, or you need to be a support risen, as in financially donated to missionary. That's not true. Uh, you can be fully devoted to God as a business owner. Number two, that the church is the primary means in which we should accomplish God's mission. Uh, there's many ways that God will accomplish his mission, and it's not just through the church. Number three, there, that there is not urgency to accomplish the mission of God. Um, and I'll, my main thing that I would, if anything stuck with you today, is this statement. We don't exist to help the church fulfill the Great Commission. The church exists for us to fill, fulfill the Great Commission. The church uh, functions as a place of celebration, as a place of praising the Lord. We come, celebrate, and praise God for what he's done in our lives, and hopefully fills and edifies us and equips us to go out. Um, So what is ministry then? My ministry and the skill sets that I have happen to be in business. So my ministry is business. I work on reaching business owners, I use my influence that God's blessed me with, the skills that God's blessed me with, and use that as a resource to accomplish God's mission in the world. And that requires strategy, which means we have to think about it. We have to strategize it. It requires our intention, meaning just not going through our day-to-day lives. And it requires our active thoughts. And it requires a purpose that God's instilled in us. So we have to identify God's purpose, we have to meet it with intention, and strategize how we're going to use it for the gospel. The Bible's pretty clear um, in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, it says, go and make disciples. Acts 1.8, the last words of Jesus talk about, it actually says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that's like our current city, Judea, that's like our state or our country, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, and that's the entire world. And so the last words of someone coming out of their mouth if they're on their deathbed are probably pretty important. Often you've seen movies, they you know, talk about, like they say, I'm sorry, or for something that you know, they lived a life that they um, you know, weren't proud of, or they turned to accept Jesus because it all became clear to them. So the last words of Jesus, I think, are pretty clear. And notice it says, go and make. It's not, it doesn't say, if you feel like it, It doesn't say if you're called, you are called, and it says go. And so God commanded us, the church is sending us, so it's time for us to step up. A question I ask business owners, um, but it's applicable to everybody, it's what skill sets you have and where God has placed you and how you can do it, um, equip people and reach people. If Jesus said, come follow me, who here would say, yeah, yeah, I'm following you. Well, let me tell you something. You all might rate, well, actually, someone, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) um, We all would probably say yes, but I don't think we all know what that really means. Because God also said to the rich man, and I'll get into the more of that in a second, to come follow me, and he was sad. That's what the Bible says. What would God ask you to give up? What, what are you not wholeheartedly doing? Because we all might say with our mouth, but are we doing so with our actions? I think Jesus would call us to abandon everything that's not fruitful to making disciples and of all nations. And for me, that'd probably be football. Football, for me, I enjoy it, I love it, but I can't really think of any way God's using that for me to make disciples. Let me tell you a story about David Platt. You ever, everyone knows who David Platt is? Um, I was watching a, um, a debate, and David Platt was, he's very focused on making disciples of all nations. He's very mission-oriented. And through his church uh, at one time, he said, we're going to just strip every cost that we could possibly can. And he took away snacks for the children because he was literally so committed to sending as much overseas and so focused on that mission that he... Stopped giving the kid goldfish. What I'm telling you is, give the dang kids the goldfish. But I'm not telling you to give up football. I'm not telling you to not give goldfish to your kids and give all that money away. But 
contemporary Christianity is surely, surely closer to non-devoted to God at all, that they just say they're a Christian and aren't doing any action or any intention, strategy, or purpose, we're surely closer to that than completely devoted to God. So, again, I'm not telling you to give up football because, please, God, I love. <laughs> but, we again, we need to be far, far more closer to being fully devoted to God, sacrificing everything, because that's what Jesus would do, than what we're currently doing. And praise God that Jesus came and fulfilled that perfect life so we didn't have to, right? Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5 says, So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. I think it's so easy in life to be a Christian, come on Sundays, do all the overall right things, but not actually put action to our step. Don't be asleep, be awake. You are the salt and light of this earth. So going back to the story, getting a little bit more into the business owners, um, I'll read this verse. Uh, Would God tell you to sell all you have if he said, come and follow me? And I'll read. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And so that's just something to self pro, uh, identify with yourself. Um, is your business or is whatever in your life really causing you to not be fully devoted to God and would God call you out of it? Is money, the love of money is the root of all evil? Is, is that something that's blurring your vision for what God has for you? A thing I hear all the time, and the third point I want to make is how urgent it is to reach the nations. I hear all the time, and it's not that God doesn't have his hand over thing, but people say it's all in God's hands. The, tr- the truth is, is God's already accomplished and won, right? He's already beat the devil, and he doesn't necessarily need you. God is fully self-sufficient w- without us. But remember, I always say it's a privilege to be a part. But people say it's all in God's hands, so we can just go about life, see things that are bad in the world, and just say, well, it's all in God's hands. But... The Bible also says be diligent and resourceful with what God's blessed you with. If it was all in God's hands, God wouldn't tell you to go in the Bible. If it was all in God's hands, God wouldn't just say, God wouldn't say things like obey, listen, or command us to do things. So what did God place in your hands? The biblical reference I think about is the parable of the talents. Uh, The master gave them talents, asked them to grow it. Two of them grew it. Um, One of them didn't. The two that grew it, good job, well done, good and faithful servant. The third that didn't, who just put it in a savings account or whatever it was, um, was a wicked servant. So it's biblical that things grow and that things are resourceful. And remember with the parable of the talents, which is money, it, they didn't grow it for them. They grew it for the master. So what has our master, Jesus is Lord, given you that you're going to grow? God has gifted you with certain giftings. He's placed you where you are, wherever it is, a business owner, whatever it is. What are you doing to be a good and faithful servant? And remember, not everything is going to have this overly spiritual movement, right? I may be doing my business group and, you know, whatever scale it's at is not in my hands. That, that's something that it's God's working through. It's the matter of that I'm available. I serve passing out food boxes the fourth Saturday of every month. We get up early on a Saturday. Do I feel like doing that all the time? Of course not. <laughs> I mean, everyone, uh, we, we choose to serve. And just like in a marriage or anything else, love is not a feeling. 
at all times. Love is a choice, and we have to choose to love God. We have to choose to love his mission and, be, and act upon everything he's done for us. Here's a few things that I want to leave you with um, to self-identify yourself, to give you something t- tangible so that you can actively pursue being a good disciple. I think I'm going to give you an acronym and hope you, hopefully you can remember. The acronym is FAITH. I think a good disciple is F, faithful, A, available, I, takes initiative, T, take, is teachable, and has a heart for God. Acronyms FAITH. You have to be faithful um, to what God's called you to. You have to be available. And for a business owner, I think that's the biggest thing. I'm too busy. So, you know, I'm not trying to get on anybody, but we have a business group. takes like an hour, hour and a half a month. You're telling me you have a business and you can't devote an hour, hour and a half of your month to God? How is that a kingdom-minded business owner? That's the non-devoted, if you ask me. And we need to be an hour and a half. I mean, I, I feel convicted that that's one of the, as little as I'm doing, I should be doing more. That's, that's how I feel. Takes initiative. Initiative with, again, where you're at. What are you doing to take initiative? God placed me here. He gave me these giftings. What am I going to strategize on how to reach the gospel? What am I doing to impact the gospel? And you always have to be teachable. I think business owners struggle with that too because us men are prideful. We think we can't learn from people. We look at our elders and we're like, ah, they're old. And our, the, the elders look at the young and they're like, what do I have to learn from such a young kid? He's ignorant. <laughs> so I encourage you to, uh, one more tip, to improve on your devotion to the Lord. You're going to need to grow in intimacy with him because all spiritual impact is going to flow from God, but it can flow through you. So how do we grow more intimate with him? And that happens outside of these four walls as in this church. This church can equip you, spark you, but your intimacy with the Lord is your one-on-one time, not just hearing a sermon. So grow in your intimacy with the Lord, and you'll grow as a disciple. Remember, a disciple is available to God and also to others. So if God places an opportunity for you to grow with him, a good disciple would take that opportunity. If Jesus was here, you would all show up. You would be available to that. Jesus is here, the Spirit is here, but we're not available. And you're also available to others. Uh, We all deal with things, and I think uh, God is going to use you most when you're working with others. And if you're too stressed out in life and choose to self-care, which is totally fine, but I think we can over-self-care, then we're not available to others. You're not too busy. You're not. You're not too busy. What I'll say, and I'm convicted myself, but we can rest in heaven. Jesus died, sacrificed his life for you. Devote your life to him. Wow. Right? It was all said today. What do you see? What did you hear? Boy, I love your point blank. I mean, you put it out there. All three of you did. Youth, children, or children and youth, (laughs) and to us adults. Let me remind us, the enemy will put anything in our way to distract us. He'll even get you excited about the good things in life or even things, things can be good. We can be distracted by our own human thoughts, family, friends, life, fun. Something I see about Jesus Christ is that he came with one purpose and he was serious about that purpose. Because let me tell you something, eternity is very close. It's closer than we realize. There's going to be a lot of rewards. There's going to be a lot of good things 
on the other side for us. But you know what? There's going to be a lot of sad things on the other side for others. And I think about when Jesus called his disciples, you know what he did? He went to the roughest places and he chose the roughest people and he transformed their lives. We can read every one of their lives and we can say, look where they came from and then look what they did after their lives were transformed for him. And I pray that everyone in this place, that we become so hungry and so thirsty for the purpose that he has placed inside of us, that we would get a hold of him for the reason that he got a hold of us. And I want you to just stop a moment and think about what are the challenges and the things that you're going through in life right now? Love what Jordan said. Maybe we're too old. Maybe we're too young. There's always these crazy excuses. But you know what? we got to get way beyond that. And if we want to overcome, here's our first steps, overcome relationship issues. When we've been hurt by other people, and we all have. When things put us in a box and try to keep us from moving outside of what God's called us to do and what he's called us to be, then you know what? We're in bondage. And in Isaiah, the word says that he came to set the captives free. How is he going to do that? He's going to use us. And when we look at the challenges and the things that's going on on the inside of us, we've got to remember why they're there. <laughs> they're there to detain us, to stop us, to get our eyes off of the glorious light of the gospel. We talked last week of how the enemy has come to blind the eyes of those who do not believe. So where do we get started? We could leave here today and go, wow, that was really a great message. You guys brought it home. Awesome. Good job. But you know what? That message was for me. What does Stephanie Harrison see from the message I heard today? It is important to get my children in church. It is, in ch it is important to get my kids their Bibles. It is important to teach them how to read it. It is important to tell them to take their Bible to the church with them teaching them how to be faithful. Because I'm going to tell you something, we're not going to always be here, and I do pray. We want the Lord to come back. But you know what? Now's not the time. If he came back today, a lot of people would be on their way to hell. How do we become kingdom-minded is that we open our eyes. I want to ask the question this morning, are our eyes shut? As Jordan said, are we asleep or are we awake? I want to encourage us to arise, awake, become alert. Ask ourselves, are we lethargic spiritually? You know, my turtle just came out after being asleep nine months. It's crazy to watch that little thing. I've had him like 13 years. He just came out of hibernation, and he eats with his legs laid out like this. <laughs> his front legs are like this, and his back legs are like this. But yet he's eating. Give him a month of eating, and he's going to be up feisty walking around. And you know what? We have our devotions. We have our podcasts. We get filled up on the word. And here's what I'm going to ask us to do. Be alert of those around us. Can we pray right now for the people that we're going to come in contact with this week and then even pray that God would place people on our hearts and you know what? That we will be about kingdom business. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would awake us to righteousness. And the great anointed words that we heard today, Father, that you would stir our hearts, Father, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And Father, I thank you that you'll take care of everything else in our lives. Father, each one of us in this room, we have been gifted. You have anointed us all, Father.
And from before our mother's womb, you knew us, you called us, and you have allowed us to live this life that we have lived for such a time as this. Now, Father, I pray for each person here today that you would stir us up with the gifts and the callings that you've placed in our heart, Father. Calls us to be hungry, Lord, for more of your word. And Father, awaken us to righteousness, Father, that we would not sin, but that we would carry your glorious light of the gospel to our cities in the majestic name of Jesus. And while every head is bowed and your eyes are closed, is there anyone here that has never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? All you have to do is lift your hand. I'm not going to call you out of your seat. But is there anyone here that would like to pray the prayer of salvation? Would you please lift your hands? Anybody? Okay, I don't see anyone, but we're going to pray anyway in case someone is here. But Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for washing us clean, Father. Thank you for delivering us from our sins. And Father, those sins that have a hold on some of us, that have us in captivity, that have us in prison, that have us in bondage, that we seem to can't, cannot break loose from. Oh, God, I ask by your spirit, Lord, that you would be our deliverance. and That you would break the shekels and you would break the chains that have us bound in Jesus' name. And today we declare that Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior. You are our God. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you to lead, to guide, to transform our lives by the power of your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you all.